Welcome everyone. My name is Charles Dremel. I'm the Waters Conservation Coordinator with the Greater Yellowstone Coalition and welcome to our second of three-part series, three-part webinar for protecting what we love. Today's presentation, presentation features Wesley Martell, GYC's Senior Water Conservation Associate. And Wes is gonna talk about water, buffalo and food supporting the sacred on the Wind River Reservation. Just a couple of details to keep in mind, we are recording this event. Um, the presentation is expected to last for about 25 minutes, and then there will be an opportunity for questions after that presentation. If you have questions that arise during the presentation, feel free to enter them into the chat, and I will monitor that, and then we'll address the questions later on. I'd like to start with uh, people and land acknowledgement, which we've gotten in the habit of doing here at the Greater Yellowstone Coalition. Long before the arrival of Europeans and the beginning of the Western conservation movement, the Greater Yellowstone, Co the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem was stewarded by indigenous people who viewed its lands, waters, and wildlife as sacred. The indigenous way of caring for the land acknowledges its life-giving energy, is centered on reciprocity, and uses traditional ecological knowledge to keep the ecosystem in balance. Today, more than 30 tribes, including the Absalagay Crow, Cheyenne, Blackfeet, Shoshone, Bannock, Arapaho, and other indigenous peoples are keepers of this knowledge and retain deep connections to this remarkable place. The forced removal of indigenous people from places like Yellowstone, the loss of indigenous land stewardship practices that resulted and the continued exclusion of native voices from the Western conservation movement are realities we must acknowledge and confront. Recognizing and reinstituting indigenous values, beliefs and practices is a vital step in restoring the cultural and ecological integrity of the region. The Greater Yellowstone Coalition commits to identifying and fulfilling its role in advancing that paradigm shift. Today, we'll hear from Wes Martell about this work on the Wind River Reservation. And I'd like to just provide a brief introduction about Wes. Wes has been with GYC for just under 10, or just under a year, and yet has ties to this Greater Yellowstone ecosystem that go back decades. He brings a wealth of experience to help elevate indigenous conservation priorities that support culture, tradition, and sovereignty on the Wind River Reservation. Wes is enrolled as a member of the Eastern Shoshone Tribe and served on the Eastern Shoshone Business Council for 20 years where he oversaw programs and legislation dealing with water, taxation, energy, and the environment. He was chairman of the Fish and Game Committee for the Shoshone and Arapaho Tribes where he helped institute sound fisheries and wildlife management planning with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service by adopting a tribal game code. His work included developing a severance tax program for the tribes and helping to draft and adopt the Wind River Water Code. Wes is a veteran and has a deep and abiding respect for the traditional values and beliefs of indigenous people. Wes, please take it Thank away. Thank you, Charles, for that introduction and welcome everybody. It's really, uh, feels good to be here, uh, on be not only on behalf of GYC, but on behalf of the Wind River Reservation and Shoshone and Arapaho people. So Christy, if you could just give us that first slide, I'd like to just start us off with where I was just this past weekend. Um, this is uh, an area on the Wind River Reservation that was not too far from where we released a buffalo just on Saturday. We had uh, good fortune of really being able to release 50 head of buffalo on the reservation. And we have two tribes here, Shoshones and Arapaho. So right now there's a Shoshone herd and an Arapaho herd, which will eventually be combined. But each tribe got 25 head of buffalo from the Nature Conservancy. And we were so, so thankful and um, happy and proud to be able to do that. And this is Crowheart Butte. And behind that, you see Black Mountain, the Round Mountain in the back. Straight behind Crowheart Butte is the northwest corner of our reservation, which is 42 miles from the southeast corner of Yellowstone. So 
you know, back in the day uh, when the eastern side buffalo used to migrate out of Jackson, I mean, Yellowstone, their migratory path, traditional migratory path comes right through the reservation, right, 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 right to those mountains up there behind Crow Heart Butte and Black Mountain. So we're very connected to the Yellowstone Park. Uh, the Wind River Reservation is two and a half million acres in West Central Wyoming. That's the same, same size as Yellowstone Park. Right below this bluff is where we released the Shoshone herd. And uh, I got out there while they were still in the truck. And, you know, when, when they pulled the truck up and looking around and people started gathering, I walked up to that stock truck and they have those oblong holes in the side. And I reached inside and I put my hand on, on, a, on a buffalo's left shoulder. And I just left my hand there for a while. Well, hey, Natcha. Kakutni. Nahawen. Risa e neta eina. Welcome home. It is a very empowering feeling to be able to touch that buffalo. And uh, I wouldn't advise trying to touch a buffalo when they're not in a trailer, but I really got that chance to be able to do that. And then when we went down to the, to the, to the buffalo uh, herd, and they had them on lower, lower trailers. And when they opened up those gates, boy, those buffalo just shot out of that trailer. They'd been cooped up for almost 24 hours. And just to see them running and galloping across our land, our prairie, it was just such a heartwarming feeling. And as I was watching them, I just thought about, you know, um, way back, the federal government tried to eradicate the buffalo. And the same with us. They tried to eradicate us. And to see them powerful and energetic and full of life and good to be on, this, on, on the ground, it was really a, a blessing. And I just wanted to share that with everybody because we had a lot of tribal members out there. We had our elders. We did things our traditional way, using our cedars and our drum. The Arapahoes, they have specific songs. They have an eagle song. They have a buffalo song. And we were able to sing those songs while we were out there, bringing, bringing, bringing our relatives back home. So I just wanted to share that with you because, uh, as you can see, we come from a beautiful part of the world. We're very lucky to call this place home, and we have a lot to be thankful for, and we have a lot to protect. So, Christy, next slide. You know, Charles mentioned 30 to the 30 tribes that have some type of affiliation with Yellowstone Park. And this map is a depiction of those tribes. And uh, I was telling people and tell, telling Charles and then GYC, just like, like Wind River, as you can see, we're the only reservation in Wyoming. And we're just a microcosm of Wyoming, you know, energy, oil, uh, agriculture and livestock, recreation and tourism government sector jobs, small businesses, and energy is kind of the mainstay of Wyoming and, and Wind River. And so that, that sector of the economy has taken a very significant hit over this past couple of years, and Wyoming is hurting, and so is, so is Wind River. And so are a lot of the other tribes that uh, are, are in, on this map. You know, a lot of our tribes in the Northern Plains, we have energy development, we have mining, we have you know, agriculture, we have you know, uh, conservation issues that we need to deal with. We have, you know, uh, you know, uh, more expansion that, that we need on behalf of tribal members and land base. And so it's just, you know, it's really um, uh, important that we all work together because that affiliation we have with Yellowstone is still very strong. You know, Yellowstone for a lot of us, it was like, it was like our hospital. It was like our pharmacy our grocery store, our garden, our, you know, it had so many uses. Today, it still is that way. And, you know, our elders, they have a very strong attachment to that. And we, we have that spiritual and cultural and traditional attachment. And, you know, seeing some of the issues that we have to deal with in modern times, it's really hurtful, you know, to see what we're doing to Yellowstone Park, you know, millions of people coming through there every month now. And so these are issues we really have to concern ourselves. 
Next slide, Christy. Wind River is a, is a home to the Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho. And like I mentioned earlier, we're 42 miles in the Southeast corner of Yellowstone. The original Eastern Shoshone Treaty was signed in 1863. And our reservation was 44 million acres. And that took part of where we are now, west into Idaho, south into Utah, east into Colorado, and then back up here, 44 million acres. And then in 1868, five years later, we were chopped down to two and a half million acres. One of the, part of the wording in our treaty is uh, the Eastern Shoshone Reservation is hereby created as an agricultural reservation. And a little bit later, I'll talk about how, how the treaty wording and distinction really, really applies. And you really have to understand that as, as a tribal government and as a tribal leader. We're very lucky here at Wind River. Uh, we're, we're, we might be the only reservation in the country with a roadless area. We have a 138,000 acre roadless area that was established back in 1932. And, you know, you, you, me, I just, I, I just feel a, a real closeness to those elders back then when they were thinking like that. You know, this area that we've got, that's the roadless area, that's some of the best elk habitat in the world. Bighorn sheep, deer. And, and, and so, you know, for them to be thinking like that, what, you know, almost 100 years ago now is that we got to protect habitat and we got to protect land, waters, and wildlife. That, that really speaks well of how we believe and how we feel. You know, this buffalo herd we have right now is, is kind of contained, but uh, with our land base here, we're, we're trying to figure out how we can open up more land. And just like a lot of other reservations, we were colonized, you know, with, with all the assimilation and attempts to make farmers and stockmen out of us. Um, our entire two and a half million acre reservation was divided up into cattle range units. And so even though we have a, an abundance of wildlife, a lot of our areas still range for cattle. A part of our belief and our values and our spirit, say, that colonized version of land allocation has to change. You know, um, right now, we're looking at how can we change cattle range to buffalo range. And so that's going to be a lot of uh, education and involvement. It's going to be a lot of uh, uh, education and communication and working with, with, with various groups. You know, I'm, I'm glad I got the backing of GYC now that I'm working with it on some of these areas because we've got programs that, that can help that. Wind River is very lucky. We have 1,108 miles of rivers and streams. We have 265 lakes here on our reservation. Most of them up there in solid pockets of granite. We have five major aquifers here, and a couple of those aquifers approach the quality of distilled water in a natural state. And on the left is our, our chief that signed both treaties, the 1863 and 1868, Chief Washakie. And you know, a lot of his descendants and a lot of his family are still with us today. And you know. I, I, I really uh, I'm grateful for the the, the treaty the, the the friendship treaty that he signed and he was allowed to at least keep this two and a half million acres we have in West Central Wyoming. Next slide, Christy. You know the uh, the Wind River Reservation, as I mentioned, you know we have. We just got a blessing with our buffalo. And now we're trying to figure, figure out how do we re-indigenize our lands? You know, states and the federal government, they classify bull, buffalo as livestock. And that's, that's, that's not the way we see it. So that's really, there's some areas of uh, politics in, in Washington that we have to uh, be aware of. The, the uh, House of Representatives passed the Indian Buffalo Management Act, and that's a very critical important piece of legislation for tribes. And uh, I, that, that piece of legislation will be going to the Senate. So if any of you, any of you want to support that passage of the Indian Buffalo Management Act, we're, we, we sure look forward to that. The Indian Buffalo Management Act actually gives, gives the Interior Secretary the authority and the ability to 
help tribes adopt Indian Buffalo management planning, Indian Buffalo management codes, regulations, standards, guidelines, all these other things to manage and take care of Buffalo better than the state or federal government. So again, I'm glad that we have people within GYC who can help us support them. You know, our culture and tradition is very critical to us. You know, you, you see the porcupine, the eagle, the buckskin, you know, the beadwork that we utilize. And this all comes from our connection to, 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 to our surrounding, to the good things that Mother Earth provides for us. You know, we're, we're trying to engage our youth in more conservation and understanding, you know, what we have. A lot of our kids don't realize we have 265 lakes and 1,108 miles of rivers and streams. One of the issues that we deal with here is wild horses, like a lot of other places out west. And, uh, you know, horses, again, are another important uh, animal to us. And so we're trying to figure out how we can uh, minimize their impact while also taking care of them. Uh, the bottom left picture, a little bit of our culture and modern day economic development, that's the Wind River Casino. And uh, both tribes have casinos and hotels. So we're, 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 we're doing our best to, to create jobs and take advantage of, of the, the great location we have. You know, as I mentioned, oil and gas, um, you know, there's fracking going on out in some of our oil fields, there's surface disposal, of, you know, produced water, uh, underground injections, uh, wellhead protection, you know, so there's a lot of issues that we as tribes really have to get more in tune with how do we acquire the technical and administrative capabilities to take better control of our land. You know, livestock and ranching, um, a lot of our tribal members out west are cattlemen and livestock producers and, and you know, hay and alfalfa producers. And so, you know, as we, as we move forward on conservation, the water, land, wildlife, it all connects. And so we have to have a management strategy and conservation strategy that acknowledges all these areas. Next slide, Christine. Again, uh, you know, we're very, we're very fortunate to be from this part of the world. You know, the, uh, all, all of these things you see here are very important to us. The grizzly is, is, is a good provider, is a good protector. He takes care of his, his family. He, he's, he's, he's He's strong, he's always, he's always on the lookout, always watching, always make sure, you know, his pack is taken care of. Same way with the wolves. And, you know, we have, uh, you see the beaver though, the beaver's a very important part of our ceremonies and tradition. They provide good medicines and uh, that we use to protect ourselves and take care of ourselves. The sage grouse, a very important part, the way they dance and move their feet along Mother Earth. You know, we have uh, in our social gatherings, we have a classification of powwow dancers now called chicken dancers. And boy, you see these guys out there emulating the, 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 the chicken. It's, it's a good sight and it just further upholds that traditional connection we have within our ceremonies, within our social gatherings, within our hearts, and within the good things that Mother Earth provides us for. We have our egos and, you know, we have, you know, we're very lucky here at Wind River. We have all of the varieties of wildlife and fisheries and, you know, winged ones that, that we see in this picture. Next slide, Christy. You know, when, uh, you know, when I used to do a lot of consulting work before I, in, in part of my, in my lifetime and, you know, tribes, water is our most important resource. And here at Wind River, we got into a water rights fight, the Bighorn adjudication where we were awarded 500,717 acre feet of surface water. Treaty provisions really impacted us here at Wind River, as I mentioned before. The Shoshone Reservation was hereby created as an agricultural reservation. Without wording agriculture, the state of Wyoming, even the federal government, and even our own tribal attorneys, and even me at that time, we said, well, I guess the only reason we should be getting water is for agriculture. And so here at Wind River on our two and a half million acre reservation, which is mostly mountains, which you can see in the background, we came up with 104,000 acres of PIA, practicably irrigable acreage. 
based on white man criteria, white man crops, white man economics, you know, and so our cultural and, and traditional and indigenous values and beliefs were kind of missing in our water rights case. And I really believe that that's critical in, in, main, in, in being able to maintain our connection of water as a unitary resource. The courts here at Wind River stole about two thirds of our surface water. And the special master has also said that we have no reserved right to the groundwater on our reservation, which is a bunch of, you know what. So there's really some very important issues that we have to consider and confront if we're going to really truly talk about conservation because water is the, the basis of all conservation on our lands. You know, some of our, most of our tribes in, in the Northern Plains have treaties and I've seen some treaties that have language that say, uh, these tribes are entitled to the arts of civilization. Well, that's good language because then you're not restricted to being farmers like us guys at Wind River. I've also, uh, see some language and treaties saying calculated to advance them in civilization. So, you know, treat, wording, treaty wording is very critical. A lot, a lot of people don't understand that. You know, uh, if you've got a large land base uh, like we do here, that really gives you more opportunity to, 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 to get into conservation, other types of areas that, that are meaningful. Right? So we really need to connect with tribes on, in, in, all, in, in all the Northern Plains. You know, a lot of our tribes are not located in their Aboriginal homeland. And so that's a conflict right there. You know, the, the trauma of not being in your Aboriginal homeland. Some reservations are shared by more than one tribe, like we are here at Wind River. Several reservations tri uh, shared by more than one tribe. We have the Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho here. Uh, the the uh, Northern Arapaho were moved here about 10 years uh, in 1878. Eight, 10 years after the 1868 treaty was signed and they were supposed to be here temporarily and they're still here. So uh, I think they moved him here because back in the day we were traditional enemies. I think the plan was put us together so we could kill each other off. But we, we, we worked our way out of them. Um, you know, I always tell our, our, our younger people and, and, and people that will listen to me is that, you know, when our Ancestors signed uh, those treaties. Their intent, their, their main purpose was to preserve a way of life. And when, chief, when we had our original 44 million acres, the chiefs back then said, you know, this is a 44 million acres. This is a pretty, guy, pretty good sized area for us to be able to maintain our way of life, to preserve our way of life. Well, five years later, we got most of that taken away. And so, you know, this, on most reservations, this land base quickly diminished. A lot of other, you know, the Sioux were the same way. They had 48 million acres. Now they're down to, you know, the Yankton reservation is 60,000 acres. So a lot of, lot of land deals, a lot of shady land deals, and a lot of dishonor, uh, dishonoring of our trees. Next slide, Christy. You know, the Bureau of Indian Affairs was established in 1824. Uh, from the War Department, if memory serves me correctly. Uh, one of the, uh, uh, that was, you know, where they started talking about, you know, assimilation and the boarding school started and, you know, all of the, uh, all of the Supreme Court laws that had been adopted earlier, Johnson versus, versus McIntosh, which, uh, you know, upholds the doctrine of discovery and says, you know, us, us, in, us people that were here when the Christians first arrived, we're subhuman pagans. So we're not allowed to own land. We can only uh, uh, occupy it. That's what the jo Johnson versus McIntosh, the Supreme Court case way back in the 1800s. That was, that was the original kind of first hit on us that really took a major hit of, of, of our sovereignty and our land base. Uh, the Dawes Allotment Act, another attempt to assimilate us, allowed ownership of land. So those tribes that had land bases, they gave 160 acre allotments to individual tribal members. And here at Wind River, we came under the Allotment Act. But for the, the positive side is most of our land is still tribal because of our mountain country. A lot of reservations have lost most of their land base. Uh, we're, we're, we work with a 
reservation that had a 300,000 acre land base. 85% of their land base is owned, is owned in fee by nine Indians. Of the 15% left of their trust land, 9% of that is owned by allottees that under the Allotment Act, and only 6% of that 300,000 acre reservation is, is owned by the tribes. However, they still have full civil regulatory authority over their entire 300,000 acre reservation. So make sure we, we, we don't lose that point. The Indian Reorganization Act was another attempt to assimilate us, you know, get, getting us to adopt constitutions. Um, out of uh, here at Wind River, we're a very unique animal because we do not have a constitution and we're doing just fine without one. And most tribes do have a constitution. Uh, the National Historic Preservation Act, there are some antiquities laws and environmental laws that really uphold tribal authority and civil regulatory authority. That's where tribes have to pay attention because that's where our power is on conservation and other issues. And the, the, the National Historic Preservation Act actually allows tribes uh, um, access to archaeological sites off reservation. So that's a very powerful law. Next, uh, next slide. I know I'm nearing the end of my time, so I'm gonna to have to kind of speed up a little bit here. Uh, Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act, tribes can assume full primacy of those programs. You know, I, I've, I've, got a, I've got a hope here of being able to get all 29 tribes and the 26 reservations in the Missouri River Valley Basin to adopt the same water quality standards. We can have be a major force of protecting the river. Same way with the other tribes, Colorado River, um, Snake River, Columbia River, tribes have some power to, to, to affect conservation. American Indian Freedom of Religion Act, we finally got our, our ways recognized. ARPA is a very important tool to protecting our archaeological corporate resources. Native American Graves Patriciation Act. Water is life. You know, this dam that you see on the left was established in 1917 that took a lot of our diverted all of our, most of our water out to the non-Indian irrigation districts. And after the reservation was, uh, after the 1868 treaty was signed, they opened up all our land north of the Big Wind River to homesteading after the reservation was signed. And so luckily most of our area's mountains and not much of that land was settled, but they took 331,000 acres of our land for this reclamation project they still have about 220,000 acre land under production or under production at one time. And there's about 111,000 acres of that land out in that area that's supposed to revert back to the tribes, but we're still fighting that battle. You know, clean water, recreation, you know, wildlife, agriculture, you know, water is life. And you know, that's, that's the main, 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 main resource we've got to protect. Uh, you know, our, our mantra here at Wind River, water is life, buffalo is power. Could we have the next slide, Christy? And just the other day, we had the opportunity to, you know, bring our buffalo home. And like I said, we sang our buffalo song. Uh, the top right picture is our herd managers. Dennis O'Neill on the left is the Arapaho herd manager. Jason Baldus on the right is the Shoshone herd manager holding his grandson, Abriel. And uh, Natcha, that's how they say uh, Buffalo and Arapaho. We're very thankful. Oh, welcome home. It's, it's so, it's so, uh, it, it just lifts your spirit. It just, it, it, yeah. I've, I've been smiling since Saturday. I mean, and I'll, I'll be smiling for quite a while after we got those buffalo. Water is life, buffalo is power. The next slide food is healing. And that's, that's our going to be our mantra from here on out. And, you know, we have the Eastern Shoshone Ancestral Foods Program that they're really doing an awesome job of identifying plants, foods, and medicines. They've got a website where you can go to the website. They tell you the name of the plant and the scientific name. They tell you the name of the plant and the Shoshone name. They tell you the nutritional value, the medicinal value, how to prepare, how to process, you know. And so it's really an important connection for our young people. And so I really, I'm so, I, I really, when we talk about food as healing, we're, we're, not, we're not just 
you know, making false claims. This is really an important part of how we need to reconnect to all that's around us. And so, you know, all that you see here, we're, we're, we're identifying, we're learning, you know, I'm working with a couple of tribes that are creating bioregions along the river to, to protect. Next slide, Christy. You know, water is life, buffalo is power, food is healing. You know, that's the, one of the upper stretches of our Big Wind River. Pretty soon we're gonna see a lot more buffalo on our lands. And we've got a lot of groups and uh, entities and organizations on the res really talking about food sovereignty. You know, I, I'm a firm believer, we gotta start producing most of our food here, here at Wind River. There's just too much contaminants and chemical, chemicals in this processed food. We gotta take care of that. Next slide, Christy. Again, um, you know, we're really looking forward to the Yellowstone National Park anniversary, uh, 150th anniversary coming up on March 1st of next year. You know, the actual creation of the park is not really anything to celebrate because they killed us and re forcibly removed us to make Yellowstone the first national park. But the thing that we can celebrate is that we're still alive and we're still going and we're growing stronger. And I really, you know, I'm thankful where I'm at right now, you know, working, not only working with my own people, but working with an NGO such as the Greater Stone Yellow Coalition. And there's a lot of other NGOs out there that are really doing good, meaningful work. We need to get connected to those. And, and that's kind of where the gap has been over the years. A lot of our NGOs, a lot of other people out there don't quite understand the sovereignty that tribes have, the power that we have under environment and antiquities and other laws. And so I believe we're a force. We're like the 800 pound gorilla in the room right now. But we have NGOs and we also have friends in Congress and the Senate that we need to take advantage of. You know, there's the Intertribal Buffalo Council that has been established 73 member tribes from all over the United States. Yellowstone's an important part of the Buffalo picture and so same with these other areas. There's national parks all over the country that need attention and need new policies under the federal government. And we need to show our indigenous values and beliefs and make them strong. I just, uh, like I said, I'm thankful, so thankful to be from this part of the world. You know, well, we always pray that our, you know, our children, our grandchildren, and now even, I even have great grandchildren. We want them to grow up to be useful and respectful and walk on a clear path. And I hope the same for all of you. Thank you. Wes, thank you for that excellent presentation, very detailed and inspiring. So much work that's been done, so much work to do. Um, now would be a great time for folks to ask any questions for Wes. And the way we'd like to see that happen is through um, writing questions in the chat. Again, if you joined late, if you scroll down to the bottom of the screen, there's a link to open up a chat box to your right and you can enter questions to your right. So it looks like we've got a couple coming in. Oh, no, these are just, these are just uh, notes of gratitude uh, to you, Wes, for your presentation. Um, I'll start with an initial question, Wes. Um, in your introduction, I mentioned your work in helping write the water code for the tribes on the Wind River Reservation. Um, could you speak to how that looks different than non-Indigenous approaches to managing water and what the process was like in writing the water code? You know, Western water law was pretty much uh, put together for one beneficial use, and that was agriculture. And in, in Wyoming, uh, you know, there's all kinds of restrictions to how you can use that water. If you want to transfer use, you have to get a permit from the state water engineer. And, you know, I mentioned we, we really um, didn't quite understand how to, how to fully fight to protect our rights. And I really believe traditional and cultural testimony is a critical component of water rights cases. You know, I mentioned that in our case, the Supreme, or the special master said, we have no reserve right to groundwater. Well, like I said, that's a bunch of baloney. But in, a, in just a case a couple of years ago on the Agua Caliente Reservation, the court said that tribe does have a reserve right to groundwater. 
So, and I looked at their website and they really gave a good kind of history of their tribe. And they talked about all above ground and all below ground and the spirits and the beings that are below ground that are connected to help them above ground. And I think those stories are important. Those are stories are critical because they're not only connected to conservation and, and protecting a resource, but they're connect, connect, connected to our values and beliefs. I think that's what convinced the judge that there is a connection below to the groundwater. And that's why they were able to do that. Our code, all you know, right up front, the purposes of our code, we fully recognize traditional and cultural importance, the spiritual value of codes. Um, all, all of our policies talk about a non-degradation policy. We don't want any, want any of our water resources or air quality to get any worse. We recognize the, the importance of, you know, we were forced to, to, to look at PIA, practically air grow acreage. I've, I've come up with a term to help tribes uh, are fighting water rights, and I call it traditional irrigable acreage. And TIA, and that's all the sage and cedars and plants and foods and medicines out there that should go to a water war too, just like our farmlands. So water core, and then again, you got to really look at your treaty language because depending on your treaty language, which tribe you are, that, that's really going to have an impact. But you know, you got to look at your policies, you got to look at the legal issues, your technical and your administrative, and carry that code out in tune with your values and beliefs. Thanks, Wes. Uh, looks like we do have one question here from Loris. What is rainfall on lower levels of the Wind River Reservation? Maybe you could just speak to some of the challenges in general of what the status of the wind, the big Wind River looks like. You know, in our water rights case, we did a lot of studies on the hydrologic cycle of the reservation. That's why, you know, talked about 1180 miles of rivers and stream. Even here in our reservation, you know, there's a drop in elevation from those farmers and ranchers that are up closer to the foot of the mountains than further down where we get into the eastern part down around Riverton. Soils classification. And then we've done some recent studies on uh, the Big Wind River and the riparian habitat is the, the Big Wind River below Diversion Dam. There's a 53 mile stretch of the river down to Boysen Reservoir. That's a dying river because of the management of the Bureau of Reclamation and the Irrigation District. So, you know, there's some real critical issues that really tie into conservation and education and getting our tribal leadership to understand their governance. You know, I, I'm, I'm always gonna be harping on that point. We gotta get leadership to understand our governance. How do I breathe life into my treaty? How, what's my responsibility as a government? How do I make my governance work for the benefit of strengthening our families and communities? And not only tribal leaders should be thinking that, all, all leaders should be, all be thinking that, but politics here in Wyoming and Montana, you know, they're anti-buffalo, anti-grizzly, anti-wolf. I just sit here scratching my head with both hands sometimes. Great, thanks, Wes. We have a couple more questions that, that have come in. First, what's your vision for Yellowstone National Park moving forward? What would you like to see change about the relationship between the National Park Service and tribes? My vision of National Park Service includes a lot of diversity, equity, and inclusion. But I think a good first step is putting an interpretive center right in the center of Yellowstone there, where Old Faithful is, a, a building that exemplifies and honors those 30 tribes that have ancestral affiliation to the tribe. I think uh, we need to show the world, number one, that we're still here and, and the, the, the amazing resources that we have with the park and how we must protect them. <laughs> you know, Yellowstone is a major supplier of the buffalo. We really need to uh, get the Indian Buffalo Management pa Act passed and start working on how do we transfer buffalo directly from the park to the Winter Reservation or other federal entities. I think, uh, you know, the Yellowstone River is an important, is one, part of the headwaters of the Missouri River Valley Basin. I've already told you of my dream to get all 29 tribes to have the same water quality standard 
So we have a louder voice in protecting the river. You know, the, um, the, uh, just the, the, the ability to use certain parts of the, of the park when we want to for gathering, for ceremonial uses. There are several tribes that still have hunting there, you know, with the masses and with those kinds of rights and considerations, there has to be a lot of discussion on how we conserve, how we address each of these areas. You know, we just can't keep allowing millions of people to come into the park every year. And so I think, uh, you know, uh, being part of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem here at Wind River, we have our part to play and, you know, upholding our agriculture, I mean, environmental and archaeological laws. What can we do to increase our influence of the Shoshone National Forest, which is between us and the national, between us and Yellowstone. So tribes, we really have to flex our muscles and exert our sovereignty wisely because we have a big role to play here. And I'm, I, 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 I just, I'm thankful for all of you that are listening because we need your help. We need, we need your, you know, even when, if you guys, if you have thoughts or ideas related to what I'm talking about, I be happy to share them, be happy to listen to them. But I, I, yeah, and with this anniversary coming up, I think that's a real opportunity to affect park policy. You know, consultation is abysmal on most areas. Um, we have Deb Holland in, in the Secretary of Interior. We have uh, Charles Sam from Umatilla gonna be the Park Service Director. Uh, Dorothy Firecloud, who's a tribal liaison to the Park Service Director, wants to get more sovereignty and sensitivity training in for park managers, and we sure need that. So I think, I, I, and then uh, Senator Raul Grijalva out of New Mexico is introducing the RESPECT Act, which will codify consultation for every federal agency that deals with tribes. I think it's a good step in the right direction. I really have my qualms about how forcibly the federal government will enforce the RESPECT Act. But if it's passed, I think it's up to us as tribes to, to do the best we can to enforce it ourselves. So I've got a lot of uh, hopes and dreams for Yellowstone and tribes are gonna be right in the middle of the picture. We have a, another question that segues into water um, it says treaty, treaty wording of the Wind River Reservation established this place as an agricultural reservation. Has the tribe received money in damages and taking in the Bighorn adjudication cases? You see other tribes getting billion dollar settlements um, from leasing with their winter's rights for millions. Uh, has the Wind River considered settlement? Why or why not? Considered what? Has the Wind River Reservation considered settlement oh, with yeah. the federal government? Why or why not? Well, the reason we're not considering it right now because we litigated and we our, our water rights case already went to the United States Supreme Court. However, whoever asked that question made a very good point about all these tribes that have signed settlement, water settlement agreements. There's about three dozen tribes that have signed water settlement agreements. And all those tribes got large sums of money to develop water codes, to develop water administrative planning, to develop uh, irrigation systems and infrastructure. And here at Wind River, we didn't settle. The state took us to court in 1977 based on the McCarran Amendment which allows tribes to be drug into state courts. And so based on that McCarran Amendment, uh, you know, the, the uh, reclamation project was, was created and, you know, we're, 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 we're forced to, uh, into the agricultural reservation um, uh, rut. And so the overall picture of, 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 the, of, the, of the code really, is critical in make, making sure that we have the money to do what these settlement tribes got. And we, in fact, we were just talking about that. I got appointed to our Wind River Water Resource Control Board in our last meeting. That was, a, that was one of the major topics. And so we think we have a claim against the federal government, not only for them not assisting us, but when you saw that picture of that dam in 1917, the Diversion Dam, there was $84 million appropriated back then in 1917. 
That was a humongous amount of money back in those days, 84 million. Well, out of that 84 million dollars, 77 million went to the non-Indian irrigation districts. When that dam was finished, they built the Wyoming Canal. They be, built all kinds of headgate and irrigation structures with that $77 million. And, on the, uh, and then on the south side of the river where the majority of the Indian community lives and our agricultural lands are, they spent $6 million. And so the BIA irrigation project is one of the worst irrigation projects in the country. And, you know, uh, uh, the more I think about us, when they were forcing us into this PIA hole, BIA should have been saying, well, you know, the Shoshone and Arapos are getting forced into this PIA rut in their water case. Maybe we should fix their irrigation system. You know, <laughs> why, why didn't that thought come up? So I think we have some very strong claims against BIA, not only for a dilapidated irrigation system, before that $77 million you created, you paid for the Riverton Reclamation Project and all those non-Indian irrigation. You know, on the other side of it, they've pretty much destroyed our river below a diversion dam. And that's one of our major efforts that I and Charles and GYC were working on and with the Wind River Water Resources Control Board. So, you know, that was a very good question because we think, uh, you know, we, we fought our own battle. You know, we, we, we paid our own way, I think, you know, for the two tribes during the water rights litigation, the tribe probably spent 12 to $15 million. I think the, the, the federal government probably spent 20 to 30 million and the state of Wyoming probably spent 50 to 60 million back in the world. That, that, that's kind of my estimate, just kind of based on, I, 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 I was with this in 1979. So I kind of followed all those steps of the, Bighorn one, Bighorn two, Bighorn three, four, five. And so uh, that's that's part of exercising our sovereignty wide. How do we get control of our water and how do we have more voice? So thank you for that question. Wes, there's a, another question related to water here. Loris writes, the West is changing, more people are moving in. Can water laws deal with these changes? What's your perspective there? Again, uh, specifically on the Wind River Reservation. On water exchanges? Water law, no, the West is changing. More people are moving in. Can oh, water yeah, laws yeah. deal yeah. with these yeah. changes? Yeah. You know, I think uh, with climate change, uh, we really got to start studying our snowpack and our systems as, as it's changing over time. Here at Wind River, we're very lucky because we have the Wind River Range on our western boundary and the Elk Creek Range on our northern boundary. So we have a lot of opportunity for storage sites. We're never going to build on main stems, but there's a lot of areas where we can just move a few rocks and boulders and sand and gravel and have a few thousand acre feet of water. You know, that's really got to be the strategies of a lot of our communities, because as we, you know, just what we're seeing going on in the Colorado River Basin with Lake Mead and Lake Powell. And then I was just reading an article yesterday where you know, they're using satellite imagery to, to uh, gauge the groundwater that's being pumped by farmers down there because there's not a lot of good regulation on groundwater wells right now. And so with satellite imagery, they can tell from looking at the crop and looking at the color and the soil, if you're putting too much water on it or not enough. And so they're really, you know, developing, you know, they just developed groundwater laws in California a few years ago. You know, now we're seeing those strategies come in, more metering, more regulation, more monitoring, uh, more storage, more transfer, more conservation, more, you know, dry year options. So there, there, there's a lot of factors in here that most people don't understand. An important factor for trying, I believe, is marketing. And that's got to be one of your beneficial uses when you adopt your tribal water code. And, you know, the, the, the power that we have is Indian tribes, we have senior rights. And one of the things that really worries me right now is what's going on up in Klamath. I think that's the perfect storm right now to really have a dramatic impact on tribal water rights. And if we abide by treaties and Endangered Species Acts and fisheries and wildlife management planning, 
tribes will prevail. But as we all know, we haven't seen common sense. You know, a lot of this, a lot of the decisions that you know, you know come out of Supreme, the United States Supreme Court, legal fiction. You know, they ignore all precedences of federal Indian law. You know, and they come up with this racist decisions to justify their continually chipping away at our treaty rights and our sovereignty and our way of life. You know, they just like I tell you, they they have eradicated some tribes. There are some tribes in the East that don't exist anymore. And so water's the basis for that. And you know, that out of the 576 federally recognized tribes, there's only about 10 of us that have water codes. And there's probably only about 40 of us that have done anything to claim our water rights. So there's what? 536 federally recognized tribes that have done nothing to claim their water rights. And that's going to be a rude awakening to a lot of these state water, water engineers out west because they've been continually approving large energy development, large you know, economic development, you know, mining companies and energy companies have more, way more influence over water than we do as tribes. So we've really got to get our ducks to get in a row and fight back. Wes, I think we have time for just one more question. I'd like to combine two that were asked here, one from Melissa and one from Kara. What's your vision for the future of Buffalo on the Wind River Reservation? And is there an opportunity for Buffalo to be a part of um, climate, resili climate change resiliency? They definitely can be a part of climate change resiliency because what our vision is right now, we have about a 90,000 acre site of land that's just a little bit south of where they are, or where the buffalo are right now. And, um, you know, and, and, and we still have much more land to, to the north of us. And so we, we, we've really uh, paid a lot of attention to how do we re-indigenize our land. Remember I talked about all of our reservation is cattle range units now. Well, how do we start making the inroads or switching some of those cattle range units over to Buffalo range? We also need under the Buffalo Management Act, we really need to help tribal leadership understand how to put together a, a water code, how to put together a Buffalo management code. How do we get the technical and administrative capabilities to move those programs and, and and acquire and, and, and manage Buffalo the way we want to, and even better than the state and federal government. You know, Buffalo are, 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 are more easy on Mother Earth than cattle. And so if we can start re-indigenizing a lot of our cattle, in, that's a very important step in, 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 in protecting the forage and the habitat. You know, the, uh, the lakes that we have are being uh, contaminated uh, you know, by sulfur dioxide and nitrous oxide, the major components of acid rain. You know, we've got that big gas crossing, uh, crossing for facility just over the mountain from us at La Barge. And so, you know, those, you know, climate change is impacted by that. We've really got to start looking more into green energy and, and, and renewables and how do we support that, at, not only from Wind River, but all trains. So, like I say, I, I, I envision a major role of tribes in the conservation efforts of this country. I envision us having a lot of involvement with all the national parks, but I, and I also think in all the major agent basins, we have a role to play in water quality and water quantity. So with that, I want to thank you, Wes, for your amazing presentation and thank all of you for joining us this evening in our Protect What You Love webinar series. Um, we really appreciate your support and interest in the Greater Yellowstone Coalition. As a reminder, there is a third and final of our fall webinar series. And Christy, could you cue the slide for that so that I don't mess up the date and time for all of you? And I'd just like to say thank you to everybody. Thank you, Charles, for your, your good moderation and uh, Christy, appreciate you. You know, I just want to let everybody know how much Christy helped me on getting this presentation together. And 
she's amazing. Uh, I just want to thank each and every one of you. You know, feel free to count GYC or me or Charles. You know, um, if, if you're interested in, in protecting and and uh, interested in learning more about Indigenous people, we we, we welcome that. Ho ho! Have a good rest of the week. And for those of you who are still on, so November 3rd, our Yellowstone Bison Restoring a North American Icon presentation with Shana Dremel. Um, I also should have introduced Christy earlier. Christy Weber is our, develop, is our sorry, communications and marketing director, um, rock star. And uh, yeah, she's like the talent behind the scenes here. Uh, if you really appreciated this event this evening, we always can use financial support with our work and particularly as we are developing our Native American program on the Wind River Reservation, you can go to greateryallstone.org backslash donate to contribute. Thank you again and we look forward to seeing you in the future. Have a great evening. <laughs>